All right, so our topic for today is global distance. Uh, specifically, we'll be using the cage distance framework. Uh, the way this kind of fits into our modules, um, in our last session um, where we started talking about global corporate strategy, we used the adding value framework. And that was used specifically to think about different reasons for expanding internationally. Uh, so uh, using global corporate scope to do things like increase volumes, um, decrease costs, increase willingness to pay through differentiation and so on. Uh, so that provided us with reasons why uh, global scope was important. Uh, the topic of this session is why global scope is difficult. Uh, so specifically thinking about things that act as barriers to uh, effectively internationalizing as a company. And um, the purpose of this uh, framework that we're using today, the CAGE framework, uh, will help you think about uh, if you are going to internationalize, which markets does it make the most sense to enter in first, and which markets might be the most difficult to enter. Uh, that brings us to our content for today. Uh, this, again, is the CAGE distance framework. Uh, kind of introducing this idea, I want to start with this puzzle that uh, the author Pankaj Gamawat started with. Uh, so he noticed the statistical regularity where physical proximity between a headquarters and a country operations around the world seem to be correlated with both amount of revenues and profit margin on those revenues. Uh, so Walmart, for example, had much higher revenues and much higher margins in Puerto Rico than they had in much larger uh, countries like China, Germany, or Brazil. Uh, so despite population size and market size, uh, this statistical regularity with physical distance kept showing up. That kind of uh, pushed uh, Pankaj to look at the uh, research on international trade. Uh, so in international trade, uh, this, uh, these results come from what's known as a gravity model. And um, international trade researchers look at factors that increase tra trade between countries, uh, which they call gravity, that kind of pulls their economies closer together. Uh, so some of the factors they've found include things like common languages, uh, which would make negotiating easier or minimize um, translation requirements, uh, being in a common trading block, sharing a common courtesy, uh, currency or land border. Uh, they even noticed that relations that um, had ended 100 or more years ago also seemed to increase trade. Uh, so if a country was a former colony of another country, or if a country is a uh, former colonizer, then they seem to have increased trade between them, uh, even if that relationship had broken down um, many, many years before that. Uh, so uh, the authors of this CAGE framework were looking at these international trade dynamics and figured out uh, specific dimensions uh, that would make some countries easier to do business with than others. Um, with this CAGE framework, there are two very important parts of this analysis. Uh, so if you're using this in your final project, you'll want to keep this in mind. Uh, the first part of the analysis is a sensitivity analysis. Uh, so you're looking at the specific industry that you're in and thinking about which of these dimensions are most important uh, for doing business in other countries. Uh, so if you... Um, are selling something like beer, which we discussed in our previous class. Uh, there are a lot of cultural connotations and associations with beer and with the types of beer that people drink. Uh, so that affects which countries are easier to do business in. Uh, similarly, uh, geographic distance is important because uh, the value to weight ratio for beer is not particularly high and uh, the product is also fragile and perishable. Uh, so that increases the cost of shipping it around the world. Uh, so that makes geographic distance important. Uh, so that's kind of what the sensitivity analysis looks like. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because you have them um, in the reading itself. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that are particularly important for the uh, types of businesses that you might be operating in 
um, after graduation. Um, again, you, any of these could be important depending on the business you're in, but uh, some of these are increasingly important uh, these days. Uh, first, uh, for cultural distance, uh, anything with linguistic content uh, becomes very important. So if you're working for a company like Netflix and you're figuring out uh, how to enter different markets, uh, you have to think about the um, content that you're streaming and whether or not it needs to be translated, uh, perhaps whether or not um, cultural references will be understood and things like that. Um, but even outside cultural content, uh, things like apps and software need to be uh, translated and localized for different markets. Uh, so uh, if you come up with a cool new app, uh, you need to think about where that will be most useful if you have it only written in English, um, or if you want to enter other markets that seem attractive but require translation, uh, you'll need to think about that. Uh, in terms of administrative distance, um, anything that's highly regulated is going to be um, increase the importance of administrative distance. Uh, so uh, things like drugs or electricity, um, of course, highly regulated markets. Uh, a couple of these that I want to highlight uh, that are becoming increasingly important. One is national champions. Uh, so a lot of countries have uh, favored industries that they heavily support. And uh, that often means that they favor local ownership and things like that. Uh, so in the US, um, Boeing gets a lot of subsidies from the US government. Uh, it's a large supplier to the US military. Uh, so that often means that uh, the US is very interested in what's going on in the aerospace industry. Uh, another example of that uh, is with China which at different times has had different industries that they've identified as strategically important uh, for the development of the country. Um, an example of that uh, from a few years ago is solar power. Uh, so they decided to invest very heavily in supporting that industry. And for um, solar power companies in other parts of the world that sometimes create a difficulty uh, trying to compete against those. Um, so that's something that may have been very good for the environment, uh, but also created a lot of um, difficult decisions for manufacturers in that industry deciding how they wanted to compete. Uh, another thing that's important with administrative distance is anything that requires high sunk costs, and in particular, immovable sunk costs. Uh, so you can think of this as uh, idiosyncratic investment or transaction-specific investment, but operating at the country level. Uh, so if you're uh, building a power plant or a mine or anything like that that requires a very large investment upfront uh, that will pay returns over many years, uh, then it becomes very important to think about things like political stability and uh, what the value of your investment might be if the government changes uh, or if they have conflict with your uh, government or things like that. Uh, in terms of uh, geographic distance, we've already talked about a couple of these in the context of beer. Another one that's becoming increasingly important uh, with the rise of service industries. Uh, so services are becoming an ever increasing part of the US economy. And that doesn't just include things like food service, but it also includes uh, accounting, consulting, um, investment banking, things like that are all services. And anything that requires a lot of local supervision or operation is going to be complicated by geographic distance. Uh, so if you have people flying back and forth, uh, the further it is, uh, the more inconvenient that's going to be and the more time that employees might be unavailable while in transit. Um, if you need to coordinate activities around the world and everybody's operating in different time zones, uh, that can make some types of coordination more difficult. Uh, if you're interacting with currencies a lot and uh, different currency markets are open at different times, uh, again, that becomes potentially important. Uh, so geographic distance is not just about shipping physical products, uh, but can also complicate things on the services side as well. Uh, in terms of economic distance, um, again, there's a lot of factors that might be relevant here, um, but a couple that I want to highlight are the uh, economies of standardization or scale. Uh, 
Uh, so in our last session, we talked briefly about uh, economies of scale and how that might operate at different levels. Uh, so you have something like um, uh, local economies of scale for Uber within each city where they need to create a two-sided network that's sustainable with both riders and uh, drivers in each city. Uh, they also have um, economies of scope globally where the same customers might travel around the world and want to be able to use the service everywhere they go. Uh, so these uh, economies of scale become very important when you think about uh, what is needed to enter each new market. Uh, if there's a lot of uh, direct network effects and there are incumbents in whatever country it is that you're entering, uh, that becomes very important for your own decision making. Um, another dimension that uh, makes economic distance important is when you need to be particularly responsive or agile. Uh, so especially if you're serving uh, consumers directly and there's a lot of ongoing changes in tastes and preferences, uh, you really need to have a tight connection uh, to every country that you're operating in so that you can adapt your products quickly. Uh, so something like fashion where uh, tastes and preferences can change um, very quickly. Uh, you need to be able to keep track of what's going on in the markets you're operating in. And the more economically similar countries are, often the more similar their tastes are. Uh, so that makes adaptation easier and quicker uh, if you are more similar to the countries that you're uh, operating in. Uh, so the first part of that was the industry sensitivity analysis, thinking about which dimensions are most important. The second part of the CAGE framework uh, analysis is actually calculating distance between your home country and other countries that you're thinking about entering. Uh, primarily, this will involve bilateral distance. Uh, so for example, um, if cultural distance is really important, there are going to be some countries that are more culturally proximate than others. Uh, so countries that you share the same language or have similar ethnicities, um, similar trust in institutions, that all lowers cultural distance. Um, for administrative distance, um, again, we've talked about some of these with trading blocks and common currencies. Uh, one that's becoming increasingly important is political hostility. Uh, so there's been a lot of polarization and uh, increased conflict between countries over different goals. Um, and things like uh, stopping travel or stopping takeovers of companies, things like that. Uh, so political hostility is becoming very important. Uh, for geographic, uh, of course, you have physical distance. That's probably the easiest of all of these to actually measure. Uh, you also have things like differences in time zones. Uh, so if it's not a physical product that you're shipping, but if you need to coordinate activities in real time, uh, having employees in different time zones all over the world can make that more complicated. Um, also differences in things like climate. Uh, so I mentioned fashion earlier as something that you need to be um, very quick in adapting to, uh, but that also factors into decisions. Uh, if you're selling clothes worldwide, for example, uh, when it's winter in one place, it might be summer somewhere else, and you need to factor that into your decisions about what you're selling and when you're selling it. Um, economic distance, um, there's a lot of things that might factor into that, uh, specifically in the cost of different uh, inputs, uh, so labor, natural resources, human capital, uh, but also just differences in uh, how rich or poor a country is can make a difference. Uh, so if you're from a relatively rich country, it's often easier for you to enter other uh, relatively rich countries because a lot of your assumptions and business models will be more consistent uh, with those more similar economies. Uh, similarly, if you are from a relatively poor economy, often entering other economies that are more similar to yours uh, is easier than entering a more different uh, economy. Uh, so these, this bilateral distance or country pair distance is primarily the focus of what we're talking about in this class. Um, for your final projects, you can really just focus on that bilateral distance. But I wanted to highlight a couple uh, unilateral distances that are talked about. Uh, unilateral distance is basically just saying that it's difficult for any foreign uh, company to enter a particular country, uh, regardless of 
where they're coming from. Uh, so that's a little less important in determining order of entry, but it could still be relevant. Uh, things like insularity, if a country is very unwelcoming of outsiders, of course, that could make it more difficult to enter. Uh, one I wanted to highlight is weak institutions and corruption. Uh, so uh, once you're working, if you're working in a multinational enterprise, you may have to take annual trainings on the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, that's a law in the United States that affects any company worldwide that does business in the United States. Uh, so even if you're a German company, if you have business in the United States, you're required to follow this law everywhere that you operate around the world. Uh, this law uh, makes illegal things like bribery. And um, again, even if you're not a US company, if you pay bribes in some country, the US might fine you billions of dollars. Uh, it could also block you from doing business in the US or doing business with the US government. Uh, so this is a very important law that often shapes how uh, companies decide to do business in different countries. Uh, so often to avoid risk, uh, particularly in countries that have high rates of bribery and corruption, uh, you might choose to enter only through minority partnerships uh, or partnerships with uh, companies that you don't have an ownership stake in uh, so that even if bribes are paid, you can try to limit your own legal liability. Uh, so that's a unilateral factor that uh, really complicates entry into a number of markets. Um, I'll jump over to this last one, low per capita income. Um, as I mentioned with bilateral distance, it's often easier to enter economies that are similar, but there are still unique uh, challenges in entering any relatively poor country. And that often just involves the amount of um, flexible spending or free spending that consumers have, things like that. Um, also, there may be uh, complementary uh, infrastructure or things like that, uh, whether it's internet speeds or the availability of technology uh, that might make it harder to enter some countries uh, if they have less development around those things. Uh, so that's everything on the CAGE framework. We have the sensitivity analysis and then the distance analysis.